Hey everybody, it's Ken Pooch Van Druden here along with Chris Rabel. Hi Chris. How's it going? How we doing? We're up to uh, episode 15. I know, man. I started thinking about how many of these are we going to have before we go back to work? Like, uh, what's, that, what's that going to look like? Oh man, I hope, uh, I think it's going to look rad. I hope that we have a lot. Um, I think we are. It's going to be episode 290. <laughs> we go do shows and don't have time to do it anymore. Boy, that would be a drag like in June if we have nothing more to talk about. Like, yeah, um, I, don't think, I don't think that's going to be a problem. <laughs> I think we're good. Uh, anyway, um, Hey guys, we are, uh, been watching all your comments and checking them out and we sure do appreciate it. And we definitely will do another Q and a episode. I know you guys really enjoyed that. So, um, look for that in the future. Um, for this episode, I thought that, um, maybe, um, you know, everybody makes mistakes. What? I never make mistakes. No. Um, no, I make mistakes on a pretty daily <laughs> hourly basis <laughs> to be honest. Um, and, uh, so I kind of thought that maybe we could talk about, maybe others could learn from, um, you know, some of the worst mistakes that we've done in our careers. Um, cause I've done some doozies. Uh, mm -hmm. um, do you, do you have one off the off the top of your mind there? One that uh, you you made a horrible mistake and you're you regret have, regret doing? Yeah, I have. There's some where I have like a series of repeated mistakes that I learned was something to move on from. But that as far as like catastrophic oh shit moments, uh, one that comes to mind immediately would be, and I bet a lot of people have this one, was not understanding exactly what would happen when you instantiate a plugin. Ah, that's what am I, dude? I'm sure, it is. I'm sure it's a lot of people's. Um, I had a, early on, I had in, in, in the venue, when I was on, you know, on the venue platform, I, I want to say like once did I simply load a plugin during a show and that was one thing as audio drops and it needs to load. However, what did I do? I remember where it was. It was a widespread panic. It was at the Tennessee Theater in Knoxville, Tennessee. It was the first song of the second set. And I had loaded... I don't remember exactly what happened. I had loaded... We did, a, we did, the, we did the first set, and I didn't like it. And I was like, I want to go back to what I did in the afternoon. And I loaded that. And wouldn't it load if you were in playback or whatever, whatever yeah. it was called? Yeah. Something happened. Where, oh, that's right. We started the set and there was nothing. There was no audio. There was nothing coming from the stage racks. Wow. That's how it worked, right? If, well, if yeah. Was, if you're in playback mode. That's right. It was looking for the HDX. I forgot the way it used to read. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Since I've been on it. So yeah. we started. They come up there. The guys sit up there. So again, we're in a theater. So you can, there's stage volume. And the guys walk on stage and I'm like, and that guy sits down and I hear, and I'm like, oh, fuck. I just knew right away. Oh, that no. Was, there was nothing coming back through the PA at all. And I quickly, you know, do you know how, like when you make these mistakes, like what we're talking about, when you realize it's readily apparent what oh, is wrong. Oh yeah. So I had to load, I had to go back and to ask it to look for the stage racks and load the entire yes. show file, which means it had to load every single plugin. Yeah. And I, and they played and man, they went for it and took off and I'm in a theater. So I'm completely, there's people everywhere. Oh and no. I just sat there like this. I just sat there while, while it loaded, plug dude, it after dude, plug it after That must have been the longest, like three and a half minutes of it your life. Horrible. And people were walking by going, turn it up, asshole. I can't hear anything or this or that. And I just sat there. I didn't look at anyone. I didn't say anything. And then that glorious moment where it dropped. And it, you know, it all came. Fortunately, that wasn't the biggest show I had ever mix, would go on to ever mix in my life, but it was big enough and it mattered. And that one comes to mind as far as just a complete devastating. Uh, and that was a mis <laughs> that was a boneheaded mistake. Uh, so that that immediately comes to mind. That that one is without a doubt one of the worst ever. That's so funny. That I mean, um, I didn't have to reload a whole session, uh -huh. but um, so you win uh, in regards yeah. to that. But um, mine, 
uh, was uh, early on in the venue platform as well. Um, uh, sold out show at the Bridgestone Arena in Nashville, Tennessee with Lincoln Park. Nice. And uh, middle of the show somewhere, probably like six or seven, eight songs in, um, in the middle, dead middle of a song, I unarmed that big blinking red button. Oh, yeah. And you went to configure mode and put it in configure mode and instantiated a plug in. And yep. uh, Paul PA goes, Rrr. there it goes. And it was, it was a large, pl- it was a MIC DSP plug in, I think, and it was really large. So it took, uh, mine was probably 30 seconds, I bet. Uh-huh. Right. <laughs> um, but the worst part about it was the up. Right. Because Uh in the 30 seconds, about four seconds into it, I realized what I had done. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. Nothing you can do. It's just sitting there blinking. I'm looking at the system engineer and going, oh, fuck. You know, you're trying to figure it all out. Right. Because at first you don't know what happened, but then you realize that, oh, it's I just did that. You know, like I just caused this to happen. Um, (laughs) And by the time you're like trying to figure out like how to fix it. It came back, but it came back at like full volume roar, 104. Oh, like you know, there was no, you know, right. taking uh, it up slowly no, or no ease into it. No, no, no. no. Me when that whole yeah. thing loaded, it was like here we are. Yes, it was like <laughs> it literally went for you went whoop, and yeah. then it felt like. 14,000 people all looked at front of house. That's what it felt like. I don't know if that's really what happened, but I was just like. Uh, you know, <laughs> and I was like deer in the headlights, you know, couldn't figure out what to do. Um, yep. but, but I'm telling you, it was the up that was worse. You know, it was just like, you know, as soon as it just, it instantiated, it just went bam, you know, at 104. Yep. Um, and then of course it's the, you know, the rest of the show where you're just shaking and you don't want to do anything because okay. you're like, oh my God, I'm, I've, uh, I don't want to touch. And anything. like all, like all mistakes, you know, that's, we learned from, I learned <laughs> that when I finished playback during yes. the day. Yes. Oh, and now, now that I'm on Digico's uh, and SSL's, I mean, I will check that. But I tell you what, you know, I'll tell you, now, this just reminded me of another one. So we have with Bruno Mars, we have this really unique situation where we will, in a lot of award shows and on a lot of TV shows, we will carry our rig into those shows and I will feed broadcast with a two mix. And, uh, and we, we should definitely do something about that one day. Cause it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's different. It can also be contentious, uh, to, to do that at all. So you've really got to have your shit together, right. you know, uh, and, and let the, and you, you have to convince them that you've got it together and that this is even remotely a good idea. That's we a whole, that's a whole episode. Like we should talk yeah. about like, and especially nowadays with everybody, you know, doing streaming and stuff like how do you make a broadcast mix and what are the, the, the kind of things that you should look out for when you're doing that? But for anyway. sure. Yeah. So we did, uh, we did SNL with whenever the 24 karat magic record came out, I guess that was 2016. And, um, during dress rehearsal, we, I did the whole bit of dress rehearsal in listen to copied audio. I was essentially in playback, but you were listening through, you were monitoring through. So, which is really not that huge of a deal, but had Pro Tools have crashed, oh man, it absolutely would have. And had NBC gotten wind that I was dumb enough to do that, <laughs> they would have pulled the plug and we absolutely would have gone to, to, to their mix. And that was one of those. So as I am, you know, I, you check it a hundred times, make sure you've come out of that mode. Oh man, I know. Uh, but as sure as I, sure enough, as I sit here and tell you, I learned my lesson that one day, apparently I didn't because at a very, very, very high profile show when I was no longer at the Tennessee theater, when I was doing live <laughs> TV, but it was just the dress rehearsal. I did the same thing. But it was just not quite, not quite the same thing, but something similar. So, oh man! I'm sure you check yourself when you finish your playback during the day. I'm oh, sure yeah. you make sure you're out, right? Definitely. Um, and only because I've done the same kind of stuff. You know what I mean? I've left it in playback. Um, I've come back to. Um, let me see if I'm saying this right. Like I've come back to after sound check or. After virtual playback, when the band doesn't sound check, I've left it in 
uh, listen, copy audio, and then uh, come back to do a line check and have things not return because they're not going to the record. So you right. know what I mean? Like they're in, they're in copy audio, but they're not being broadcast somewhere. So there's no loop to it. So right. when I bring it up, it's not working. And my first reaction is, is like, oh man, this isn't working. Um, like for instance, all right. So I have um, in Iron Maiden, I play uh, intros in between songs. I'm the guy that triggers that from front of house. Um, oh, and yeah, like, not a playback. Guy. Well, there's not a playback guy, right? So yeah, so I'm the guy. Um, right. So the way that I'm doing that is um, I'm running it through. I'm using the same sound grid network that is being used for the the record and the virtual playback. I'm just using a couple of channels of that sound grid network and using it on a different computer. So it sources from a second Mac mini that plays all of those, um, you know, intros. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I'm actually using a, a, uh, a native instruments machine, you know, like a, uh, just to have pads to trigger them quickly. Right. Um, okay. so, so I use machine um, and I'm using the audio from that travels down the sound grid network, right? And then to my desk via the sound grid network. Well, if it's in copy audio, it won't let, you won't hear those intros, right? Those intros will, um, are, are kind of flipped in the console. So if you take it out of copy audio and it's in the normal, uh, way that you're listening to the show, um, mm -hmm. then, then you can hear it because it's traveling down that sound grid network and showing up into two channels. But if mm -hmm. the other way you're listening from the tape side of it and you can't hear it. Yeah. Cause it's not in the Matty loop. It's Correct. not right. Correct. Right. <laughs> so, so I've done that. I've literally done virtual playback and then come back at, you know, eight 30 to do a line check and been like, Oh shit, the intro machine's not working. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, I'm seeing audio here. I don't know what's going on, but, uh -huh. and then I just go, ah, oh, God, I'm such a dumbass. And then, you know, take it right. out of copy audio. Um, so, I mean, I, I've done that. I've done that a few times. And once you do that a couple of times, you're like, okay, I know what's happening. I know. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. I'll check that thing a thousand times. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, I've done the same thing with, I go to do a, uh, a line check. Um, in the old venue stuff and the same thing, like left it in virtual playback and come back and, mm -hmm. you know, kick and nothing's working. And it's right. like, well, nothing's working. Cause you're in, you're in the wrong mode in the wrong mode. But, yep. um, yeah. Um, let's see. What's another one. You got another one? Oh, I got plenty. I wrote a few down. Oh, did you? Uh, well, there's one that I mentioned on here before is the first time I ever loaded a snapshot. Uh, I mentioned I loaded a snapshot and I proceeded to mute the entire PA because I hadn't scoped. I didn't scope my outputs properly. Oh. You know what I mean? I had only, it, I had, that was another one. Uh, so now I am extremely diligent about scoping outputs and safing them. Going back to the episode we did when we showed our files and we talked about how we save things and this and that. Um, I'm incredibly diligent about, safing outputs, yes. making sure that no random matrix, no random group, no ra any, just a little, anything going out from an input <laughs> is safed. Uh, because when I did that, I mean, that honestly, that scared me more. And that was in an arena too. That scared me more than, than the having to load the whole thing. Cause it was literally just button push in the middle of the show. Oh my God. And yeah. just the whole thing just went poof, and I had no clue what happened. Like I didn't know. I knew with the plugin fiasco, but I didn't know what happened here, nor did my systems guy, you know what I mean? It took a minute to unearth what had happened. Oh my God. Yeah. So, uh, I had a very similar experience. Um, but mine was, um, at, uh, rock and Rio in Portugal. Okay. Oh boy. And mm -hmm. rock and Rio in Portugal guys, if you've never been to that gig, um, they do a very interesting thing where they put PAs side by side, I don't know if they do this anymore, but they, they did for a while um, mm -hmm. where they put the main PA had actually two line arrays right next to each other. And what they wanted you to do was create um, 
stems basically out of your console um, to make acoustic summing um, so that send some information to one left and right line array and send other information to the outer part of the left and right line array thereby having more power i think is what they There's, yeah i think the argument it's like the complexity of the waveform is not as much you know you're only asking the speaker Anyway, it's just it's just like the conversation we had in the last video where we spoke or two videos ago where we spoke about, um, you know, um, uh, Lisa and immersive audio. As soon as you uncouple all of my electronic summing, mm -hmm. then I f it makes me super nervous, whatever. But one year I got talked into it. OK, mm -hmm. so I'm like, all right, I'll give this a shot. And honestly, I can't remember who the artist was. Um, I know it was the headliner, but I can't remember who it was. It might have been Linkin Park, but I don't think so because I, I don't remember. I didn't get any. It's weird. I didn't get any blowback for this, but it was like what happened was horrible. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, OK, you don't get a whole lot of limited time. Even as the headliner uh, there, you show up there at like six o'clock in the morning and they give you like a half an hour to kind of hear the PA. Uh, and that's it until showtime. So I spent the afternoon in headphones kind of building out stems that I thought were going to kind of work together. Right. So I did that. I built out stems. I had in, in one left and right of the PA, I think I had like vocals and guitars or something. And then the outside was bass and drums. Right. Um, I think that's what I did. I, I can't honestly remember exactly what I did, but Anyway, I was like, all right, this should work acoustically. Sum all of these, you know, stems together um, and it should work. So show starts. I unmute. I'm like, OK, it's yeah, all right. It's kind of working. And about halfway through the first song, I kind of got all my stems worked out, you know, and so everything kind of worked. And I was like, oh, OK, this is uh, this is maybe going to be all right. Um, <laughs> second song, second song starts and I triggered oh, the second oh, snapshot going. Oh and no. I, I didn't build all that into the rest of my snapshots. Oh, oh. What'd you do? Did you just hang on the same song or something or no. So I couldn't figure out what was wrong at first. I did the same thing. I was like, what, what happened? What's going on? You know, I couldn't figure it out. You know, we're, I don't know, you know, 15 seconds into the second song, there's still like nothing coming out, you know, cause none of it's going to all the right places. It's all assigned and muted to the stems that I had aren't there, you know, because all of that was all part of the snapshot scope. Right. So it all changed. And this is, you know, honestly, it's what's changed my life about snapshots in the same way with you, all yeah. outputs and all that rest of that shit is, <laughs> unscoped Absolutely. it is Absolutely. always on never changes you know yeah. uh outputs um yeah. that's a uh, gigantic show to learn that lesson on too oh my god um so probably i would say about 20 seconds into it um i figured out what was going on and triggered back to the first snapshot right that's and, what I would just go back wherever you came from. Right. Well, that's, I, I didn't think of that right away, but it, it took, well, you know, I'd say like 15 or 20 seconds. It, it wasn't, to me, it felt like an hour, absolutely. but it was, it was probably not that long. Whatever. I finally went, oh, fuck, you know, triggered it back to, to uh, snapshot number one. Um, and then um, I said, because I can't remember who the art, I wish I knew who the artist was. I can't remember. Anyway, um, all the snapshots were, heavy heavy changes i mean like 300 parameter changes snapshots these are snapshots that i gotta have right mm -hmm. so uh i'm screaming at the systems guy you know um a long friend of that i've had for years this guy peter i'm sure you know him he's a, he works for um gabby som down there um oh yeah he's great that yeah. guy's great Peter Racy, Peter Racy, he's awesome. Yes. Um, so, but I've known him for years, but I'm here. I am in the middle of the show, like, oh, we need to go to, you know, only left and right and stay in left and right. And when you're ready, let me know. You're going to mute all the rest of it. And I'm going to trigger the oh, third snapshot. Okay. Are you ready? You know, I mean, that's literally what was going on. I'm screaming at my. I would feel the same way. Even if it was my mistake, I would immediately be like, this is all because I had to do this stupid shit you're asking me to do. <laughs> 
you know <laughs> i you know listen i took the blame i said you know i definitely knew this was my fault i made this mistake but i was panicked and trying to get it back in the moment um and so basically it was me and the system engineer and then peter the the main system engineer for the rig all looking at each other and counting each other in when I was going to trigger the snapshot, when my system engineer was going to do a change on his end for the patch, and when Peter was going to make the whole system mute the left and right on the outside out and be just like a regular PA, right? you know, Um, which is what everyone else did that day. I don't know why the hell I decided that I should try it. Um, (laughs) You know what I mean? I got talked into it. I did. And like some, anyway, uh, yeah, it was, absolutely horrible and and we did we kind of counted it down in between a song you know the mm-hmm. second song was me mixing the first snapshot through the through just, yeah, yeah like just on the fly like making it go and then about halfway through the second song is when we're screaming at each other when it's 104 dba weighted you know, uh-huh. you're going to turn this off. You beat yeah. this. I'm yeah. going to trigger the third <laughs> snapshot and then I'm going to count you in. You guys ready? And yeah. then, you know, it's like in between the second and third song was me going, okay, three, two, one, go. It's third uh-huh. snapshot. Yeah. <laughs> jink, oh. jink, third uh-huh. snapshot. Um, and uh-huh. uh, and then it, it came back and then it probably took me, I would say another song because I hadn't mixed on that PA in a normal left and right configuration anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so it took me a while to, you know, kind of feel where that was on the regular way that my mix was coming out of the, right. the desk. Um, right. So yeah. Uh, don't scope your outputs. If you're a front of house guy, don't do it. Yeah. I wonder why they ever did that anyway. It looked awesome and I think they still do it. Um, I, I think on those grounds, but never for that festival. Um, I think that, um, you know, uh, like Dave Ratt had some success doing that. That was kind of his thing. Um, I think there's some argument that uh, the headroom and the amount of um, information coming out of two different PAs is leads to better headroom, you know, um, a better clar- not, I, clarity. I, I, yeah, I get it. It's just a super ambitious thing to do at a festival. You know I what know. I mean? Dude, but they did it for years. Like they I did. showed up, I showed up like three more years after that in a mm-hmm. row where I, mm-hmm. <laughs> where I showed up and they were like, we know, we know we'll leave it in left. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I would, I would say the same thing. I'd be like, no, I'm not reinventing yeah. this. They're like, no, don't worry. We, we're not going to ask you to try it. You know? Right. Um, right. But <laughs> anyway, that was a, that was a fun one. That's what else, great. what else you got? No, I, okay. This is not from a specific situation, but something I learned over time that I felt was a big mistake of mine. And I think it's a big mistake. A lot of people make was over EQing and over compensating for what I felt was feedback suppression. Uh, if that makes any sense. In other words, totally does. Basically what I'm saying is I would ring a mic out too much. Yes. Um, and hack on. away, hack away at your PA too much is what you're and, saying. And, and hack away. And we did one of these. It's crazy. You know, we're getting up in the numbers. I can't remember which one it was about, but I was talking about having a vocal bus and that, like a lot, of, and a lot of people in live audio do that now, particularly as we have, as we have more routing options now where I'll have a, a vocal bus but for and and some people do a lot of processing on that vocal bus mine is essentially just a pass through that if i choose and i don't always choose to use it sometimes that vocal bus feeds back into what is the music bus so they're all living in that moving bit of compression or whatever the processing is but sometimes you want that vocal bus so it's not subject to the you know to the question. So, uh, just explaining for anybody, anybody listening, but what I use it for, I'll have that vocal bus with no processing on it. But what I'll do is if I have to put a filter in, like I don't use any of the, uh, feedback exterminator. Now there's plugins, you know, back in the day, there were all the boxes that would, <laughs> it finds the frequency and puts a notch yeah, in. Yeah. What was that box? It was a sure box. It was, um, sure had one, there was a Sabine. Yeah. Feedback Ashley had one. I forgot what Shures was called. There was all these different ones. Um, and I, I remember 
I remember um, when I was mixing Limp Bizkit, uh, Bill Chappelle was mixing Corn, and uh-huh. um, Jonathan, the lead singer, Corn is an amazing singer, but he sings really low, man. And the stage volume was like super loud, you know. And so he had to use that sure thing. He had that what is a you know single space sure deal. I to, could see it to ring the mic out. Yeah, yeah. And the and the deal with those, it's like if you have a person that. Well, first of all, if they're stationary, okay. If they're stationary, there's some resonance that's at there at that spot. Sure. Not going anywhere. If they're moving, you're still going to have your hot spots in the response of the mic or this or that, but it's going to change as they move. And if they're a cupper, if they cup and hold differently throughout, all of those things change. So whether you're using one of those units or you are just sitting there turning it up repeatedly and repeatedly and you're just hacking shit at yes. a certain point, all you're doing is just you're changing the tonality and you're losing gain. That's right. So now that being said, do, do I have to do it every once in a while I do. And what I'll do is I'll do it at the bus level because if my lead vocal, if he's not singing loud, he or she's not singing loud and I need to make a cut at 1.8, you know what I mean? I want all of the vocals to now be neutered at 1.8. I don't want he or she to be softer than everyone else. And right. that means effects and everything. So, or, I mean, I used to struggle so bad. You know, now that I've learned, like I know that an empty room, I know that a monitor guy walking the mic or a sound check, I'm going to have at least 5 dB more gain out of that mic when people come in that room. I Me just too. know I mean, and too. I'll do sound check with the vocal tucked, man, because I know I'm going to get it once they fill it. And you just have to have that. Got to have faith, man. Have faith. Have faith. I know. I mean, I'm the same I'm way. Saying, I'm the same way. I'll, yeah, I'll take, you know, Ramon Morales and myself, who's a monitor guy. We've worked together for years. We did Lady Gaga together and we do Bruno Mars together now. And we would walk Gaga stuff all the time. But mind you, she is on it, man. Or if it was a headset, she's on it, you know. And it really wasn't that big a deal. We'd walk it, but it was more of a formality. Nothing would ever ring. If it did, we'd deal with it. Uh, Bruno, who we work together with on now, he's a phenomenal vocalist, but he's all over the place. His mic technique is somewhere near his head. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And uh, that mic is so hot, we don't even walk it. I don't want to hear it. It's going to freak me out. I rely 100% on faith <laughs> and, and experience to where, you know, I just, we don't even walk it because all it's going to do is freak me out and cause me to fuck it up even worse. No, so right. I, learning, so to summarize it all, I think learning the lesson to not go too hard at, but I don't know where to tell anyone. I wouldn't know where to tell a viewer where, how do you know when to stop? That's just experience. You know what I mean? I think it's experience, but I also do think, I mean, any time that I start getting like any more than like four filters into stuff, I start going, man, there's something wrong or, right. um, there's something that I could be doing better than doing this EQing. You know, I always tell people with EQ, when you're cutting a bunch of low end, really what you're doing is boosting a bunch of high end. You are, you know, right. and vice versa. You know what I mean? So, yep. um, the more stuff that you hack away at stuff, you're just making the other stuff that you haven't hacked be more prominent. So that's why when you get into anything, like if I'm on a lake processor and I'm starting to hack any more than like four filters, then I know that, um, I I'm probably, there's probably something not right in what's going on. Um, right. And you can look at the PA, look at the zones of the PA, think yeah. about where it's coming from. And you know, as well as I do, like, let's say they're not in front of the PA, you know, you, it's all the stuff we know to do. Check the front fills or check just the relationship. If there is, you know, if there's wedges or side fills, check your relationship to the monitor person. It's, there's so many things you can do before you default to just hack, particularly at the input level. Yes. You know what I mean? At least go to a bus or go to the lake or go something that's, that's not going to affect it too much downstream. So I can't give you a specific, I can tell you, I struggled for years. I had, I can think of one vocalist I work with where for years it was never loud enough. And I go back and I think about it now. I'm like, you know what? I could have gotten him out there. I abs- it wouldn't have been like raging loud, but I, I could have done it if I just chilled the fuck out with 
just cutting and cutting and cutting and, you know. Oh, I mean, honestly, and I've been in lots of situations, um, you know, Lannis Morissette, she's just like Bruno in the sense, excellent vocalist, but her mic technique is just like that, somewhere around her head. Um, yeah. In fact, most of the time it's around her waist almost, right. you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so, like, proximity effect, throw that out the window. You don't get any of that. Mm -hmm. Um and I found out early on with me working with her that the 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 road you want to travel down is keep hacking away at stuff and keep trying plugins, you know, that have vocal gating and you know all this kind of stuff. Um, and I discovered every single time that I traveled down that road, if I went and just took all that stuff and zeroed it back out again, mm -hmm. the end result was better than where I was down this weird rabbit hole of cutting all that stuff. So um, I think, you know, that's a hard thing to teach, right? You know, that's experience. You have to get used to that. But I will say to you guys out there that um, are having, are struggling with a vocalist. Um, I, I'll, I'll often um, just to hear what's going on, pop plugins out like i'll pop yeah. the whole chain out just to mm -hmm. be like am i making this better or am i not making this better um because i mean you know two two times out of ten i'm not making it better <laughs> with right. the stuff that i'm doing um so you know it's something that may help you to learn um what to do which is you know man every once in a while just pop that whole rack out and listen and and be like oh man there is so much it sounds so much nicer with that 200 that I hacked out of there, for instance. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah. And even up on compression is a big one, too. We all want the, I mean, I love the sound of a compressed vocal. That is, man, that is. Well, that's the sound of today. Every main lead vocal sounds like that. Exactly. You made a comment on one of these recently, like listening to a record, like, oh, how am I going to get that sound? It's like, we, we can't really get that. I mean, we don't have 20 dB of compression to put on unless it's a screamer who's not leaving the stage and it's buried. That's right. You know, so it's, the, it's the expansion part of that that fucks us over, right? It is. So when it we is. squash the hell out of stuff, then as soon as they pull it away from their face, now we're 20 dB hotter and it's going to take that, off. Yeah. All that stuff's coming back up. So a lot of times I feel like people could help themselves in the in the feedback department, if they just chill out on the compression, not, mm -hmm. I mean, creatively, it might not be as cool of a sound, but man, if you want to make it through this show and not have a bunch of feedback <laughs> and have them hear the vocal, <laughs> guess what? Ease up. You know what I mean? No, that's true. That's true. And, and I have, um, definitely come into that situation where I've been like, okay, you have to make some compromises. If you really are digging into this vocal and you're like, man, the vocal sounds great. But as soon as they pull away from it, um, that was true for me with Alanis Morissette. As soon as she pulled away from it, the expansion came up and it was just like, oh my God, now I'm hearing the entire room in yeah. her vocal mic, which was then destroying my mix. Right. Um, and so I had to compromise and say, I can, uh, you know, do less compression and don't have all of that expansion coming back. So, yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. What, what, what about you? You got any more? I'm sure you have sure <laughs> some. I got, not, I got tons. <laughs> right. I'm sure if I think really hard, like specific fuck ups are going to come to mind. But uh, uh, what are you? What are you thinking? Hit me. Uh, let's see. Um, I did one in uh, record land uh, uh, when I was a recording engineer. Um, that was a, a horrible mistake. Um, I'll say it quickly because most people are here for the live part of this, but it was, it was a, uh, a life changing event for me. Um, I was working on, um, um, do you remember a band called Everclear? Yeah. Um, so I worked on the, so much for the afterglow record. Uh, this was back when we were using 24 track tape. Um, so no pro tools. And, um, I think by the time we finished the recordings, every song had at least four 24 tracks slayed together. Wow. Um, he was just one of those guys that like, if he, if we had done that record now with pro tools, totally That's easy, fun. we just would have, you know, we would have done track after track of guitars and you know, whatever, but he was playing that game back then when, you know, 24 track machines 
Uh, you only had 23 tracks because the 24th track was empty. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, most of the time you only used 22 because you needed a guard track between 23 and 24. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, so it was crazy because like if we would be doing overdubs, um, you would try to make a slave mix of individual 24 tracks. So you would try to leave four tracks, for instance, on a 24 track available so that when you get up into two or three 24 tracks, you could make a stereo mix of that 24 track to keep on one, one machine so that you could have, it's like making a stem basically, so that you could have just that one machine operating because the technology in order to get four machines linked together um, was this technology called Lynx. Um, and basically what it did is it read Simpty uh, tone from each 24 track and then made machine control to to sync up those machines. So it wasn't a, uh, a technology that was like super quick. So if you had to have four machines rolling when you were doing overdubs, you would literally have to start 30 seconds before the overdub uh, punch in point because you'd have to wait for all four machines. Okay. Finally, they finally they get synced after about 20 to 30 seconds of four machines trying to sync with each other. Um, so super frustrating. Like if you were having to work, like if, if the stems that you made weren't what he wanted and you had to go back to where you had four machines linked up and try to do overdubs with the four machines, it was pretty crazy. It was dumb. Um, and we did that a bunch. Um, one of those times, um, I had just finished uh, recording probably six tracks of guitars and um we were getting to a point it was i i think i'd been working 18 hours straight i was you know just completely exhausted i uh pressed rewound on rewind on one of the 24 track machines armed track 24 and pushed record mm -hmm. which means that i recorded about a 20 second gap <laughs> of simpty oh. uh, before i realized what i had done uh -huh. um, was probably 20 to 30 seconds of um, recording over the Simpty tone, which is the only way that you can sync oh. 24 track machines together. Right. So now I had an entire slave, 22 tracks of guitars and all kinds of stuff, tambourines and all kinds of crap that were now was now basically unusable in that song mm -hmm. uh, because that could no longer be synced. Um, so there's a fix, but it's literally, it took me, um, you know, probably I'd say 24 hours of me reprinting Simpty on that 24 track and then trying to figure out what the offset oh boy. was of that machine. So in mm -hmm. the end, I got it to sync back up and therefore didn't get fired, but it was 24 hours of me at the studio, um, for a mistake that I, that was a 20 second mistake. Yeah, that's good. Good one. So, um, I guess the lesson there is, um, uh, even when you're exhausted, um, try to pay attention to what you're doing. Um, yep. you know, I mean, I, I literally, I don't, I still, to this day, I don't know why I, why would I arm track 24? You would never do that. Like, I don't even know why I did it. I was asleep basically and went arm and then into record and like sat there and stared at it while it was, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> while it was running, just staring yeah. at it, looking at the big red light going, I don't know what's happening, you know? <laughs> um, I, I just thought of one. Okay, um, what do you got? I knew, I knew something would come to mind. This was when I was young. I was probably 20, 21, and I was working at, uh, I was working in Nashville at Soundcheck, uh, which that place was like super formidable in my upbringing. I was the weekend and nights guy. Nice. And it was great. So now it's uh, even more of a sprawling complex, but essentially it's, have you ever been to Soundcheck? I have. You have. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, that's right. We were going to hang out there. We were going to hang out there <laughs> when, there, we were do something for the when there when there wasn't a giant tornado that knocked out the entire 
city. Right. But anyway, right. go ahead. So there. Uh, so anyway, it's all the. If you guys don't know, it's a big uh, rehearsal place. They had at that time there were four large. There was three rooms that were about the same size, and then one super large room. Then there's all this storage there for all of Music City, and they also do cartage. They take gear all over town. There's still a thriving, you know, uh, studio scene, or there was in the late '90s. There still is now, but there's really nowhere. Is there really a? a it's it's the last bastion of true like fully functioning studios that are working all the time. And um, so anyway, it was great for me because I would at night when people would leave, this was back in the analog days, I would go through there. I would literally like sweeping the floors and cleaning up and whatever, you know, literally mopping shit and cleaning sinks and toilets and everything. But I would go into all the, the rooms where the engineers were working. And back in those days, it was analog. So even if they shut down, I could still see all their settings. Nice. And, and this is, you know, when you're 20 or whatever, you can stay up for <laughs> two hours, no problem. Just and so I would stay up all night long and just go to the rooms and look at like everybody's shit. And I could tell what everybody was doing. And it was really, really cool. And I would like ring out wedges all night. I would take the PAs apart and put them back together and just I'd fix shit. It was great, man. I was like a kid at a candy store. So one day Donna Summer was in there. No rehearsing. way. Nice. Yeah. So who I think was a Nashville native at the time. And, uh, she was rehearsing and I think they were, I can't, I think they were using eighth day sound or something like this. This is probably 1996 or 97 or something like that. And the monitor guy had to leave. And so they were going to let the kid come in there and just babysit monitors for her. Right. So I'm like, fuck yeah, here I go. You know, I come <laughs> strutting in there. I mean, I was scared to death. I'm sure, but I was whatever. I was strutting in there. I was ready. And I was behind like, I think it was an XL three of stuff. I just had no business being on back in the day. If you remember when ear monitors came out, everybody always had an Aphex dominator in line. Oh yeah. To the outputs to all the ears of the Garwood radio station or the future Sonics or whatever. So Back in the day, the whole thing with ear monitors, and this is also a little bit of a uh, diatribe on where we've shifted with ear monitors. Now, ear monitors, it's the wild fucking West, man. Everybody's blowing their hearing out. It's wide open. I know. Everybody turns the limiters off. Forget it. But back in the day, it was like, hey, we've got these really delicate things in everyone's ears. And we're going to preserve their hearing with these new ear monitors. So they had these super brick wall limiters yes. for you guys that don't know what the Apex Dominator was. But before there was digital limiting, uh, there was that and it was like no more it's signal gets here yep, go back. that's it so everyone had it right so i don't know where the hell i was monitoring but something happened during the day where she needed just a few changes and i'm like no problem no oh problem. no this, nah. next thing you know it turns into the whole you know diva thing right. where they stop everything all of her people come up there and the direct quote to me to young chris raybold was this is the worst sound I've ever heard in my life. And I was heartbroken. Man. Oh, no. And I didn't know what the fuck was going on because I didn't feel like I had done that much. And then I realized once we got going, I looked over and whoever, the mon whoever was doing the monitors, he must have been running right up to the threshold of those things, but knew to stay under it. Right. I, Gung Ho, came in there and was pushing into that limiter and it was just destroying it. So that taught me a big lesson about knowing about signal chain and particularly everything as it pertains like on your outputs, what's it going through right. and where are you monitoring in the chain? So that was a big one for me. It was Donna Summer telling me, quote, this is the worst sound I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was, you know, <laughs> oh, man. I will oh, never... it just so crashed. You're like, oh. Oh, it killed me. I just oh, remember no. looking over and I saw those, those, the dominators, the meters were just like, oh, oh. <laughs> but, That's right. horrible. Part, you know what? Part of me, too, to this day thinks, I'm like, did that dude set me up? Like, how close must he have been to the threshold? But, I don't think that's the case, but I just, I can't imagine I did anything that drastic, but, but apparently I did. Wow. So know your crazy. chain, know what's downstream from where you are mixing. Or, or definitely know where you're monitoring in your chain. Um, exactly. For sure. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Um, I, uh, one of my favorite ones that's happened to me a bunch of times in my career, and it's not really a mistake, but it's just, it's, well, it is a mistake. Um, when you, <laughs> when someone is negotiating with you in your salary, um, they, they say, well, how much, you know, how much 
are you thinking for salary? And you spit out a number to them and they immediately go, okay, that's great. We'll put you in the books. <laughs> oh, it's like, oh my goodness. Yeah. They're like, no, I could have gotten so much more. If they agree to it right away, you know that you, yep. you lowballed yourself. And, yep. um, I've done that a bunch in my career, you know, um, you know, the reason they call it negotiation is so that you can, uh, come in a little high, you know, don't scare them away, but I always, you know, tried to, to come in a little bit on the high side. Um, and then if you come in on the high side and they agree to it when on the high side, then go, okay, great. Cause look what I just did. Yeah. Um, but if you, you know, in a negotiation, if you come in on the high side and they quote something that's lower, um, I always pretty much when I am negotiating, I like have a target in mind. Um, and where I say, I'm not going to agree to anything less than this. Um, right. and, um, you know, if, even if they, uh, say something less than that. Um, my answer will always be, you know, well, I'm going to have to think about it cause that's not really, you know, mm -hmm. what I was thinking, but, um, yeah, it's the worst, worst mistake in the world is to, is to spit out a number and have the business manager go, yep, no problem. Where do Almost, we send, the, where do we I'll, send the check? <laughs> right. Oh, thanks bargain basement. That was, that was great. Yeah. Appreciate that. <laughs> I, thought, I, just, I thought of another one. I don't know. We're good on time, right? Oh yeah. Come on. Every week I say I'm going to set a time I ever do. Um, again, this wasn't a mistake so much as it left a mark. And we talked, uh, I guess it came out today, the one about kind of having a signature sound, you know. And I always, from the very beginning, I was very impressed with a very powerful sound. Yeah. And I love the sound. I love of what we can do with impact and power particularly on the low end and I'm getting to the almighty kick drum. Uh, and I mentioned that the, the lead kick drum mix is, and I think I, my exact quote was it's a bullshit sound. It is when it's, when it's the reason that it's so impressive is it's eight times louder than everything. That's true. That, that's not cool, but Oh my God, if you can make a kick drum, like so incredibly powerful and mean something yet not become comically loud that that's great right so i was at uh i was at red rocks and i was uh, mixing this support act and i felt really good about what i did and i knew the uh i knew the headliner kind of this guy again i was a kid so this is a little bit after that incident with donna summer in nashville but, probably, probably <laughs> but not, not much <laughs> probably not too much. so i knew enough to be dangerous but this or that and i'll just never forget finishing the show feeling good about it and turning around and this front of house guy, he was cool to me, but he, he kind of had it out for me and him and his cronies, him and his like systems guy and his buddy, they were kind of laughing. They were, and they were kind of joking about how it, my kick drum was too loud. Right. And you know what? I think it probably was. Okay. I think they were right. And that was so burned me so bad that I didn't start tucking the kick drum by any means, but it just left an impression of not being the lead kick drum guy because that's such an easy thing to poke fun at. Oh man, you know? I know. So, uh, but anyway, so again, old, not a mistake, but there was definitely a rub a dig made at me that there was probably some truth to, you know how a lot of times that when the asshole comes up to you at the show and tells you something and initially you're just like, Oh, what a jerk. I don't want to hear it. And then you're like, there's probably a shred of truth in there somewhere. <laughs> You know what I mean? Totally. There's something he just said I need to look into. I need so, to, to pay so attention. Times, yes, there is some truth in there. And I think those guys ribbing me about my too loud kick drum were right. And it just it just left a mark that I was not going to be the lead kick drum guy. <laughs> Don't some, people would agree. some people would come to my shows and be like, no, you're very much the lead kick drum guy. <laughs> But <laughs> well, I was going to say, don't worry about it. There's a lot of other really famous engineers out there that have that, uh, for sure. they have that trophy. Yes. Um, <laughs> yep. for uh, for. Symp symphony for kick drum is what I call it. Um, uh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. So the one and only time, uh, that I've ever been fired in this business, um, was not for, the way something sounded. Um, but, um, 
I was, good. <laughs> that's good. Fun. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Uh, so I never got fired for anything that sounded bad so that I can still, you know, I keep that trophy in my trophy case. Um, mm-hmm. But um, I did get fired one time. And uh, what I got fired for, and this is something that you guys should really pay attention to ex- even or more so even in this day and age with uh, social media and YouTube and you know all those kind of things um, about getting permission from an artist to broadcast any sort of information about that artist. Um, so what I did was um, I was in rehearsals with an artist um, for three or four months um, we were at uh, center staging in Los Angeles um, and it was crazy. It was a, a time period when we were, or the band was looking for a new guitar player uh, and it was uh, basically guitar auditions um, every day. And the, the guitar players playing the same four songs. Um, and I was there because the main artist of that band uh, wouldn't come to the rehearsals. So I was, about this. I was mixing, um, I was mixing audio, um, for a camera. Uh, and then that, um, uh, tape was basically being taken to the artist's house and that guy, he would watch the, the guitar auditions for that day. So I was getting paid as a front of house guy, basically to mix front of house to a, a videotape that would then go to the artist thing. And I did that for four months and it was, it was crazy. Um, but during that four months, I was asked by a manufacturer, um, to, if they could come in and shoot a video with me about sound. Um, and I said, um, yeah, of course. And this was, uh, a really hard lesson for me because it was the, the first time where, I didn't really get, I kind of got permission. Like I spoke to, um, the artist's assistant about it. I said, you know, Hey, listen, these guys are going to come in and film the video and it's all about sound. It doesn't really doesn't have anything to do with the artist at all. It's just, you know, we're going to come in and and they're going to come in and film me doing some, some audio. Um, so the manufacturer showed up with a, a kind of a big video team. We did a bunch of discussing about audio. Um, and then, you know, they did some cutaway shots of me, like walking into the whatever dressing room and, the you know, walking into the main room where all the instruments were set up and all that kind of shit. Um, so, um, I assumed that that, uh, that, that manufacturer was going to send me the, Mm -hmm. the, uh, edited version of that for me to approve. Um, and, uh, that never happened. Um, basically I, I think kind of, it was my fault too. Like I didn't really ask for that. I just was like, yeah, thanks a lot guys, you know, whatever. And Mm -hmm. they, um, edited it and they released it and two hours, two hours after it was released, my phone starts blowing up. Oh, and, dude. Uh, it's oh. management talking about how there's all these video shots of, you know, the rehearsal space that, you know, all the fans are seeing what the drum kit looks like or, you know, whatever, da, 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 you know, had I been given the opportunity to approve the video, I would have sent the video to management mm-hmm. um, and had them approve it and maybe could have saved my, my job. Um, so, but I don't blame the manufacturer at all by the way, um, right. they just did what they thought they were like, yeah, cool. He's just saying that we can do this. Right. Uh, I blame myself. I made that mistake of not saying, so if you learn anything from what I'm telling you right now, it is, <laughs> if you ever do any sort of press or, uh, talk to anybody about where there is filming involved around what you're doing, you have to say to them, even when I do articles now for, magazines or whatever for front house magazine i always am very clear about getting right to refusal you yes. have to send me a copy before it gets put out into the world that's um a, that's a big one for the hot shot out there that's like kind of hitting his his or her yep. right and is getting ready to be that person make sure 
that you 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 have you see the final proof and right. absolutely any time that you release anything that is related to any artist make sure that you get management re approval on anything like if even if my article is only about uh turning the knob on a compressor which has nothing to do with the artist that i'm working for i still send that article to the management company to approve i, I got one real quick i'll jump in here when this whole when the whole covid thing struck and uh when i was in again i was back at nashville fast forward 20 something years i'm back at soundcheck uh we canceled the kenny chesney thing as i was doing that i was doing cancel and a friend of mine from college is a news reporter in uh in in nashville and she asked me if i would come down and like do an interview and uh so, and i said yes but i now mind you this was just to go down to do this like and it's a local tv thing it was going to be like 15 seconds of me talking at most you know i reached out to management and i said hey i'm going to go down there and they're going to mention the kenny chesney tour that had just canceled and it was public that it had canceled and I, but i was like are you okay with me doing that Yes. And the guy was like, yeah, sure. No problem. Thanks for asking. You know, totally. and when I got down there, she was wanting to know, it was just a little too much. It's kind of like, well, how, how exactly does this affect your pay and how this, and I was like, nope, nope, nope. Yeah. We've got a very broad generalities here yeah. on how we talk about it. Let's talk about how this is affecting the music industry. You know what I mean? Like you got to know where. Absolutely. And, and so you need to set your boundaries with press guys. You know, unfortunately, fortunately in our business, there's lots of press guys that show up that genuinely want to know about questions about audio. And, um, you know, the reason that you're doing this press piece is to, you know, share your knowledge about what you're doing with audio. But unfortunately there are unscrupulous dudes that the whole reason that they're there is to get the latest scoop on what's happening with the artist that you're working for. Right. Um, and so you have to set boundaries, man. You have to say to them, you know, and, and the number one boundary is you cannot, you have to get it in writing, get it in an email. You cannot release this until I approve it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's the number one thing. And then when they start asking questions, like what you're talking about, um, you know, I, I've said to guys, I said, I'm not comfortable where this is going. So let's ask me another question. Right. You know? Um, yeah. so anyway, um, I thought that that was, uh, an interesting one. Um, you got any other ones? I do. I just thought of something. I, this is not anything that I have ever really fallen on the sword for and never really <laughs> totally fucked up in this regard, but I'm super conscious of it. And this is basically when it comes to talkback mics, your talkback mics. Oh shit, I got a great talkback one. Keep going. Okay, good. <laughs> I really don't, but here's the deal. And, th and that's kind of like fucking up on the talkback mic is kind of like sending someone a text that is actually about them. I mean, that's like, it's uh, bad. I've done that too, by the way. I have absolutely done it's that. It's the worst. It's anyway, the worst. So yeah. I, I'm bad about talkback mics. If you just give me one with the switch, like I just fucking space it, man. I do. I just, I space it. I put it down. I just, I, I'm not good at it. And, uh, <laughs> on Lady Gaga several, several, several years ago, my buddy, Danny Clocker, who is our crew chief, uh, and a uh, monitor tech is a fucking awesome guy. He comes storming out the front of house and mind you, Lady Gaga, particularly at that time was one of those tours where like you work 20 hour days every day for months on end. I mean, everyone is just so tired, you know, and, uh, he comes storming out there and he's got a foot switch, like a momentary foot switch in his hand. And he just takes my fucking talk back and he plugs it into this oh, thing. He was, he was a good friend of mine yeah. and he puts it at my feet and he's like, you use talk, you use, you use, use that right now. <laughs> and I'm so glad he did because there are times when someone will come out to front of house and I do like, I'm such a nerd, man. When I spec my front of house rig, I even have a specific kind of Atlas mic stand that I like. And it's okay. just, it's not to be a little bitch. It's just what's to, up diva. It's totally, <laughs> it's summer, divas and all these others. It's just because I know exactly what I want. I know where I want my mic to be. I want this. I don't want to pick it up. I totally want to be able it. to lean over. And, uh, that foot switch has become an integral part of my workflow. And I always know it's there. And there's a lot of artists I work with that the second the song is over, we we're talking about headphones not too long ago. I have their vocal queued up yes. with I'm listening to the house and I'm listening to them like this. And I have my foot 
on that talk back. Switch. Ready to talk right back to so yeah. the second they say something. Yeah. I'm able to come back. And for some of the people I work with, it's in case they're bullshitting me, busting balls. I can hit right back. I mean, it's all for, I mean, that's this, this second a song ends. I'm ready. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, but yeah. I, when somebody comes out to talk about something really mission critical, even though I know that foot switch is there, if, there, if it happens to be a switch mic, I'll turn the switch off and I will unplug, unplug the, the XR. XR. Yes. So there is no way that anybody can hear me say shit because you hear horror stories about people. And I do, I speak so, now that I'm used to that foot switch there, I speak so freely at front of house. Like, God forbid any of it make it down that mic. You're fucked and there's no coming back. <laughs> you know? That's so awesome. So, I mean, yeah. I'm the same way now because mainly, um, you know, it's happened to me a, a couple of times. But uh, if any, if there is mission critical, like someone's coming out there, it's a manager, it's the artist, that nobody else should be hearing what's going on, I do the same thing. Unplug. Unplug it. Unplug it. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, because I don't trust a switch. I don't trust a, you know, this is the yeah. only way that I know it's uncoupled and there's no way that they're hearing it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I do that. But uh, so we're coming to the end here, but I'll, I'll tell you this story quickly. Uh, my story is um, about Kiss. Uh, Kiss playing at the Tokyo Dome um, in Japan. Um, and this was point source line or point source uh, boxes, prism, Shoko prism boxes. So there's shit loads of them. Um, and um, God, I don't even know, you know, like hu huge amount of boxes. Ace, this when I worked for Kiss, it was the original four members. And so Ace Freely was the guitar player. Um, and uh, at the Tokyo Dome, the way that they had built the subs, there was a, a whole block of subs that were on the ground, but then there was a whole other block that was on a, a runway, basically. So they weren't coupled together. They were apart from each other by about a foot, whatever. But they, you could walk in front of those subs. Um, so we're doing sound check um and you know I'm, I'm mixing on an analog console this was a long time ago and uh ace starts wandering out on this you know walkway and mm. i'm watching him just get pummeled oh. by sub information every time the kick drum gets hit i can oh, physically see him <laughs> i can physically see him just going uh -huh. <laughs> you know i mean just getting like just pummeled right so um <laughs> he uh you know song ends and he's out there and he comes like wandering back to his microphone and he goes hey sound guy like he didn't even know my name i'd been working for him for like three years he didn't even know who i was uh, he goes hey sound guy it sounds a little woofy up here <laughs> and i go i pick up my talk back and i go that's because Ace, you're standing in front of 118 18 inch speakers. And as I'm pulling the mic away from myself, I thought I hit the switch, but I didn't. I went, that's because Ace, you're standing in front of 118 18 inch speakers, you fucking jackass. Oh no. <laughs> All of that made it through? Uh-uh. Did you survive? Did he just not hear it? Dude. The entire stage, including Gene and Paul, oh. erupt in laughter. Oh, 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 just like holy dying. Shit. That's and, exactly what I'm talking about not doing. <laughs> and Mike Adams, the monitor mixer, um, yeah. who is now a, a, a rep for Claire Brothers, um, yeah. Uh, it's his favorite story to tell because oh, he said God. he was on ears and he said it was like, you know, what Gene and Paul heard was, you know, clear as day, me going, you fucking jackass. Uh, <laughs> as oh. I'm pulling away the microphone. Um, so luckily, uh, Gene and Paul uh, thought it was funny. And I don't think, honestly, that Ace heard it and didn't really know what was going on. He kind of was like, why, what's, why is everyone laughing? You know? Yeah. Um, um, so I got to keep my job, but that's my talk back story. Make sure you have it switched off. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> make sure wow. you make sure you have it switched off before you uh, say shit. Anyway, um, that's about it for this one, guys. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, we sure appreciate you. I hope you guys had fun with this. Um, if nothing else, um, learn a little bit about all of the, uh, 
uh, mistakes that we've made and, and hopefully, um, uh, you won't do some of the same mistakes that we've done. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for subscribing and, uh, we'll see you guys later. See ya.